All right, we're going to be in Revelation 14. Revelation 14, we're studying religion in the tribulation. And so we're going to bow and have a few moments of silent time before we begin our Bible study. So you can pray, represent yourself before the throne of God, and use the rebound technique if needed. That is 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments. Our Father God in heaven, we are grateful for this time together as believers on the earth. We pray you bless our time together in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 14, we're beginning a section here which contains information about Babylon. Babylon. I'm going to read our verse, verse 8. Another angel, this is another angel of the same kind, followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, we're beginning to study Babylon in the tribulation because it represents religion. You should know that Babylon right now, the, the city is desolate. It's not actually there. It's desert right now. Uh, very little, if anything, is there literally, physically, of the exact location where the ancient city of Babylon used to be. And so we recognize that this is not a literal um, idea. Babylon here represents religion in the tribulation. So we began to look at religion in the tribulation last week. And what we're going to do is review the points that we covered last week. And then we're going to head on in to the rest of our PowerPoint. Religion in the tribulation. We saw, first of all, that religion is, in fact, man working to gain the approbation of God. Christianity is a relationship with God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ, the Son. We saw that the tribulation is the most religious period of all time. Religion has to explain away the rapture. That won't be hard. Religion will claim the negative people, negative volition, the gospel will claim positive, positive volition. Religion fills the vacuum left behind by saying no to the gospel that has saturated the earth. Gospel propagation, two ways, evangelism by love or evangelism by disaster. Regardless of how negative, the religious will be pounded by four waves of gospel proclamation in the tribulation. Religion will be permitted to operate without restraint for two reasons. Remember, freedom is the environment in which the angelic conflict is resolved. It's the environment. Man must be free to choose, and therefore in the tribulation, he can choose for or against religion. Also, religion will challenge believers, challenge their ineptitude. It'll challenge their resources. It'll challenge their inventory of ideas. It'll challenge their paradigm. It'll challenge believers to learn Bible doctrine. 
lack of Bible doctrine causes believers to get into religion. Religion in the tribulation does what all religion is designed to do, worship Satan. He, by the way, is the author of do-goodism. Any religion that seeks to solve man's problems by man's effort is satanic in nature. By the way, Jesus said when he was on the earth, the poor you will have with you always, the destitute you will have with you always. Jesus did not heal every person he met. He did not feed every person that he met. He did not clothe everyone who was wearing rags. He, in fact, gave them the message of salvation, which was first and foremost of importance. If they died in rags, if they died of starvation, they went to heaven. We're about to go to the Philippines. That's something good to remember. A lot of these people are going to be living in shacks. It's not our job to get them out of the shack. It's our job to get them into heaven. Point 10, which we've already looked at, all judgments on religion are designed to awaken the unbeliever to his need for the Lord Jesus Christ and is therefore fair. Most of the judgments are against religion and those that adhere to it. Point 11, we saw believers do, who do not separate from religion will take part in the judgment upon religion. By the way, I've got to reverse right here. Any happiness that you may gain from being in religious groups, religious events, religious social clubs is temporal and fleeting. It's actually pseudo-happiness. Do you know why? God's about to hammer religion with the biggest act you've ever seen. And guess what people are going to do? They're going to stand from afar and wail that the source of their happiness is now gone. See that? And what have I told you? There's three things in this world that cannot make you happy. Can you answer which one, what they are? This is part of my teaching. I hope I've pounded this in. People cannot make you happy. If you want to be happy with another person, you have to carry your own happiness into that relationship. People cannot make you happy. If people are making you happy, you're about to ride a roller coaster, friend. But tomorrow, they'll make you sad. And your life is going to be like this. Things cannot make you happy. Fire destroys, the thief kills, the moth eats it away, Jesus says. So any happiness you're getting from things is pseudo, temporal, fleeting. Because a lot of things can happen to things, let me tell you. And your circumstances cannot make you happy. You say, well, if I was only in the Caribbean with a drink in my hand, I'd be happy. Well, when you get your credit card bill from being back from the Caribbean trip, you're not going to be so happy. You're going to be working double time to pay for it. If you will, mute your microphones. Sorry, I got into the meeting late, and so therefore you're going to have to mute your own microphones. So watch this. The most miserable people I know are trying to get their happiness from what? People, things, and circumstances. And all those are completely variable. And therefore, they're riding the roller coaster of life. And if you've got one thing from my ministry, I, what I want you to know is you can be completely happy, independent of all of those things. You can be happy 
with somebody or without them. You can be happy with things or without things. You can be happy in any situation, in any circumstance you find yourself in. And that's the beginning of sharing the happiness of God because His happiness is like this. It never changes. So you need to be stable, and part of that stability is deriving your happiness from the correct source. That's your relationship with God and Bible doctrine. So watch this. In Revelation 18, we're going to find out believers are gaining some kind of temporal happiness from religious activities. Guess what? Religion's down. So are they. Point 12, we saw an analogy of a prostitute and religion. Remember, they both use the lust pattern of the sin nature. One, sex lust. The other, approbation lust. If you will, mute your microphones. We saw in point 13 that the Antichrist, that's the dictator of the revived Roman Empire, he is going to have a doctrinal outline, a religious system. I'm going to have to go back in here and do this. And then we also saw under point 14 that the false prophet, he is going to outline religious systems and eventually demand worship of the beast, the Antichrist. Now we're going to have more on both of these guys in religion coming up. So that's what we covered last week. Now, let's go on to a new point. The dictator of the revived Roman Empire. Remember, he's the beast out of the sea. He's the head of a ten-nation confederation. He's also the head of ecumenical religious system. Ecumenical means worldwide, world exposure, world adherence. It really pertains to Christianity. And this may even be called Christianity. It may be called some form of Christendom. If you, if you saw how many people followed Joe Osteen, and what you find out is he, he is a psychologist. And he has picked up the Bible. But if you'll listen very carefully to his uh, spill at the end, I can't, I can't remember exactly how he says it. It's been long since, so long since I heard him. He says, he says, I repent of my sins. What else does he say? Can you remember? Something at the end. But it's not the gospel. And he says, I think I repent of my sins and I receive you into my heart or something like that. It's goofy anyway. And he says then, if you prayed that prayer, we believe you got born again. You know, he's so happy about it and lighthearted and charismatic. But he never mentions the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on their behalf, not even part of the spill. And we know the gospel is what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he never talks about it. And therefore... And you should see, he's got Hindus in there. He's got Muslims in there. He's got Catholics in there. 
he is drawing people from all over the world in there in his huge coliseum and guess what they listen to his message they feel better about themselves they go out lost if they die they'll go to hell well guess what Dictator of the revived Roman Empire is Joe Osteen made over. He's going to be a charismatic personality. He is going to promote a utopianism society where everything is clean and sparkling and new, where everybody has a pleasant personality. College will be free and health care will be free. And everyone will have an EBT card to go to Walmart and pick out what they want. And there won't be any plastic straws. They'll all be paper. He is going to outline what religion is in his utopian society. And people will follow him because he is charismatic and he makes them feel good. He may even call it Christendom. He may call it church. But it's pseudo, see? The second big personality we know of in the tribulation, he will be the leader of ritual worship in Israel. In some of our notes, we call him the dictator of Palestine. He's the false prophet is who he is. He's also a dictator who gains ascendancy through the working of miracles, and he eventually demands the worship of the beast out of the sea, the Antichrist. Now, do you know, know who the, okay, who's the Holy Trinity? I saw a joke the other day. It said, my daughter is only allowed to have three male friends. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. <laughs> They're the Holy Trinity. Who is the unholy Trinity? They're going to be here in the tribulation. Do you know who they are? We see two of them here. The unholy tr Trinity is the Antichrist, the dictator of the revived Roman Empire, the false prophet. The dictator of Israel, religious Israel, and then the dragon, Satan himself. That's the unholy trinity. Point 17. Religion gains political ascendancy. And in the revived Roman Empire, religion will control the state, resulting in the extreme loss of personal freedom. You will adhere, or you will be an outcast. And if you know anything about areas of history where religion and state have mixed, you will see that the worst persecutions that have ever happened in the history of the world are when you re mix religion and state. Because then you have the power. Force it upon the people. I want to stop right here and tell you, you know, we're seeing in America, we're seeing some of the conspiracies to destroy American freedom. We're seeing some of those exposed now, which is a good thing. 
and they were real, and they're multi-tiferous out here. They're, they were buried before, and my God, they're coming to light now. And, and thank God we had enough revival in America to get us a leader who represents the revival in the minds of the people. Okay, That's the only reason we got him. If we hadn't had the leadership we have now, we'd be buried. So watch this. My friend was saying, you know, but there's so many bad people out here that are working to destroy America and make it a socialist state. He said, why? You know, why? How can there be so many brainwashed people? Can't they see what socialism and communism has done throughout the history of the world? And I say, yes, but, and this guy's a born-again Christian, but he doesn't necessarily operate as a Christian. I said, you have to remember, when we're gone, when we're out of here, the seed has to be planted. It has to be left behind where the Antichrist can step in and have control over millions and millions of people. And guess what they already want? A big centralized government to solve all their problems. And that's exactly what he's going to give them. And so you see the religious system outlined by the revived Roman Empire and its dictator is mixed with political power and it gains ascendancy. This means it's going to be like it is in North Korea right now. You can't say anything about the great leader. If you were to whisper any kind of insult or say anything bad in North Korea about the leadership right now, they can hang you. They can put you in prison. They can do away with you. It'll be the same way in the tribulation. So to speak openly about Jesus Christ would in fact make you an outcast immediately. Point 18, ecumenical religion, that means worldwide state-sponsored religion, will have adherence in all nations. It'll be easy to get it too because all the dictator has to say is, hey, we've got the bank account and if you want to share, you're going to serve our religious system. And look how great it is. So why wouldn't you want in? So some nations will have 100% involvement, some 90, but all will at least give lip service. And it's the same way with the United States right now. We send money all over the world. We sponsor Islamic states and places where the leadership will say, yes, we need your help. You know, we need your grain. We need your subsidies. We, will, we want all of your things. But then out here on the street, if an American was to walk down the road, they're going to stone you to death immediately. Or it's death to America. Uh, they're stomping our flag and everything else. So. Point 19, utopianism, socialism, and white tower politics will dominate the political spin of the tribulation. And this is because Satan has five I wills. Remember in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14, the five I wills of Satan. I'm going to look at them now. Satan says upon his fall, I will ascend into heaven. That's the third heaven. I will exalt my throne 
above the stars of God. That means he'll rule angels. Satan doesn't have a throne, but he's going to have one here in the tribulation. See that? He's going to demand worship. He loves it. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. That means he'll rule man. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That means I will be supreme. This points to his false messiahship. Remember Jesus Christ says, I will come back on the clouds of heaven in great glory. Well, this is Satan's throw at false messiahship. I will be like the most high God. In other words, I will be God. So we know Satan seeks to be worshipped as God. Now here's what's cool about what we're studying in the tribulation. It's going to start with all believers being gone. And Satan is going to have fertile ground to set up this system. Not a lot of problem. He's going to set up a utopian society where you can have food, clothing, health care, a college education, operate in freedom in his world as long as you worship him. And everything is going to be clean, bright, and nice. It will be a utopian society for those that adhere. Everything will be promoted as being beautifully happy. The problem is Satan cannot control the judgments that God pours out upon his system. And you're going to see that God sends plagues. He sends falling stars. He sends earthquakes. He sends floods. He kills the fish in the ocean. He turns the fresh water to blood. Well, how's your utopian society going? You see? Oh, I see. Satan, you failed to give fresh water to your people. Look at what happened. You failed to give food. See, he can't set up his false messiahship because he cannot control the judgments that God is about to pour out on the earth So it's so funny to me to see how Satan is going to work so hard to make it good enough where Jesus Christ can't come back, where he doesn't have to come back. But in fact, God is going to knock over his blocks and ruin the utopian in society that he sets up. Point 20. There are three different ways people are attracted to to the tribulation's ecumenical religious system. Point number one, the first way, is the dictator of the revived Roman Empire, his outstanding personality and leadership. Even though he is going to be a super nice guy, and very friendly and uplifting and have an effervescent personality. He is going to be a ruthless dictator. We see immediately he is going to instigate warfare and overcome the ten nation confederation. There's only going to be seven of them left when he's done. People are going to follow his charismatic leadership the image remember the false prophet is going to set up an image and also a system of ritual and worship some people love ritual worship I don't know if you know that or not if you've ever gone to a Baptist church you get into some of it because you are going to get into a ritual. You're going to sing a 
song and then you're going to turn around and tell your neighbor how beautiful they look and you're going to shake their hand and then the deacon's going to come up and pray and then they're going to pass the offering plate and then you're going to you're going to sing an offertory while they're doing that and then you're going to sing uh, two more songs out of the hymnal and then the preacher's going to come up and he's going to read a verse and then you're going to pray and then he's going to preach 15 minutes and then they're going to sing just as i am for 14 verses till somebody walks the aisle Somebody gets so hungry, they got to say, we got to get out of here, so I'm going to walk the aisle so we can leave. And then uh, you can come down and join the church, or uh, the pastor will pray with you. And then in the end, he uh, gets somebody to pray while he walks to the back door where he can shake your hand while you walk out. And it becomes a system ritual. I've been through it. And it's got to happen the same way every time. Well, what's even worse than that is the Catholics up and down in the pew and quoting Latin and all of this stuff that nobody even knows what it is, and they're just going through movements. It's ritual. Some people love it. We have a friend that loves it so much. She married a Baptist man, and she couldn't give up her Catholicism, so they agreed to meet in the middle, and now they're Methodist. So the false prophet of Israel is going to take a lot of these unbelieving Jews who are going through the motions at the temple. He's going to be able to make do all these miracles and say, now look, y'all follow me. And those who love ritual are going to fall right in line. Thirdly, economic pressure. You can't shop at the grocery store without the mark of the beast. Can't have electricity without the mark of the beast. So on and so forth. But finally, we see that ecumenical religion falls at the peak of her power in Revelation 18, 2, also Revelation 19, 2, and 3. This judgment is going to take place in one day. It's going to be so um, concise and permanent that the adherents are going to cry. They're going to stand off afar and they are going to wail. But we're going to have to bring forth a new point because here's what you may not recognize. God is going to use evil to destroy evil. And when Babylon is destroyed, God is not going to do it. He is simply going to pick up an entity and let them do it. judgment by finesse just like he took Rome and he used the lesions of Titus to put Israel out of the nation under the fifth cycle of discipline we're going to study this in Revelation 18 final point point 23 religion is going to infill the concept of of temple worship and therefore makes it impossible to teach the truth so the temple is supposed to be the place where all Bible doctrine is taught under the Jewish age but in fact it's going to be impossible So this is an important point for Pastor Brad. Don't veer too far off course from Bible class. Because once you start up the fall foliage tour, the pottery class, 
the Blue Hair Society, social groups, or whatever it is, you're going to get yourself in trouble, and you're going to have to fight your way to get back to teach Bible doctrine. And that's why I'm so glad I got in contact with Colonel Thiem, who straightened me out early on on the pastor-teacher's responsibility. And so we see in the church age, the church is the divinely ordained classroom for the dissemination of Bible doctrine. Not a social group. Not a tea party. Uh, not a place to come and have fun. Or uh, whatever else that you get caught up in. And I find there are pastors who have to fight their way to the pulpit to teach anything. Because they have so many different little things going on. So God is going to sidestep the temple as the place where truth is supposed to be communicated. And he's going to put out four waves of evangelism. The 144,000 Jews. Moses and Elijah on down on a street downtown Jerusalem. An angel flying through the heavens and tribulational martyrs. Now what I'd like to do at this point is take a look at Revelation 18 and possibly some other passages. And we're going to read some here about the destruction of Babylon. <laughs> Let's start in, um, well, there's, actually, we could, we could read a lot. The uh, Revelation 17 is a section. I, I probably should go back. Let's go back to Revelation 17 1. Let's take care of a few verses here and take a look at them. John says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. That's religion. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. See, this was pseudo-happiness they got into. Remember what I told you about that? So he carried me away in spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. That means that's the source of all the killing of believers in the tribulation. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now that's religious Babylon. Let's go over to verse 14. Revelation 17, 14. These will make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them. This is Operation Mop-Up, remember. For He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are called chosen 
and faithful. That's church age believers. That's you. Second advent. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are the peoples. Remember the water of the sea, the Gentile nations? Multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate, naked, and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That's judgment by finesse. That's God using evil to wipe out evil. Remember, I told you, God is going to use evil to wipe out evil. He's not even going to do it. Now, the burn with fire here could point to nuclear war. And it's going to come back up in chapter 18. Verse 17. Okay, let's look at Revelation 17, 17. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill this purpose. Evil judging evil. To be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman who you saw in is this great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now let's look at Revelation 18.1. After these things, I saw an angel, uh, saw another angel coming down from heaven with great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, "Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean." And hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So you can't trade unless you take part in the system. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people lest you share in her sins. Remember, even believers who take part in this religious system are going to take part in the judgment unless they separate. Lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to the heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as you rendered to you, and repay her double, According to her works, in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her right lobe, I sit as queen and am no widow, and I will not see sorrow. You see, the utopian society is high and elevated and thinks it's without any blemish. It thinks it's totally protected. The Hunger Games, going to the capital, it's exactly the visage here. Verse 8, therefore her plagues will come in one day. There's three plagues here. Death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire. The utterly burned with fire could be nuclear war. It says it's going to be totally wiped out in a moment. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. Verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, 
in the mighty city. For in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. For no one buys their merchandise anymore. The system is shut down. I want you to go on and see, see these unbelievers of the earth. They got their money pot that's ruined now. They're hauling all the goods. And by the way, you should know that the part that gets bombed here is in fact the revived Roman Empire. It's not Babylon over in the desert by Iraq. We're talking about um, the same European cities that made up Rome and the citadels. And so when they're sitting in the Mediterranean, they're looking over and they're seeing a mushroom cloud come up from Rome over here. And they're saying, ooh, we, I don't think we're hauling our stuff over there anymore. Who's going to pay us? I got a load of perfume and nobody's going to buy it now. They don't need it. Revelation 18, 20. Divine viewpoint. Re rejoice over her, O heaven. And you holy apostle and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of the harpist, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. Wiped out. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who were slain on the earth. And so we see religious Babylon is destroyed by political Babylon. We're going to learn that when we come in to Revelation 17 and 18. God uses evil to judge evil. And here... Religion is destroyed. And you know what happens in Revelation 19, right? Jesus Christ comes back in Operation Mop-Up. And he sets up the Millennial Kingdom. So I want to finish up by saying this. When you see the word Babylon in your Bibles... If you study Isaiah, you're going to find a literal meaning. It actually was a city that existed in Isaiah's day. And you can see that in Isaiah chapter 14. The literal Babylon is talked about in the Bible. But when you come to Revelation, you need to recognize that Babylon is mentioned. But in fact, it is not the literal city. Right now, it's sitting in ruins. Saddam Hussein tried to start rebuilding it, but it's out in the middle of a desert. Nothing there. Didn't happen. So we see that it is, in fact, not the literal meeting. Babylon in Revelation has two different ideas. First is the religious system, and that's the harlot sitting upon the beast. She has the cup of fornication that the world drank from. And the second is political Babylon, which destroys religious Babylon. We're going to look at both of those aspects coming up. We still have to study Revelation 17 and 18. And so we'll be back here. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and attendance. And my challenge is for you. This coming weeks and months, why don't you look at the world 
And you don't look at these socialists out here and say, this is so hor horrible. Liberalism is a mental disorder. I don't know how people can think this way. I want you to think about these people walking right into the tribulation and being primed for this system. That's exactly why they exist. And they're going to have to be here in order for the Antichrist to have power. That's his appeal. A utopian society based on a centralized government and a one world religious system. It's going to happen. Could happen at any time. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for delivering us from the tribulation through the rapture. Father, we pray that we can leave behind, plant the seed of faith for those who may be left behind. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.